This episode goes out to our patron, London. Thank you so much for your support. Hi there, Garrett Robinson here. Welcome to the 25th episode of the Nightblade Epic Podcast Season 3. Hey listener, you've only got a few weeks left to pre-order Tales of the Wanderer Volume 1, the latest book of Underrealm, at underrealm.net slash wander. This gorgeous three-book volume contains the first three novels in the Tales of the Wanderer series. It's a story about best friends and found family. It's about deciding who you are, no matter what anyone else says. And it's about the stories we tell ourselves every day, and how we can never really control what other people do with those stories. In short, this is my story about stories. It's me writing about storytelling, which is the only thing I've been doing with the last 12 years of my life. And I think it's pretty good, and I think you're going to like it. Pre-orders are incredibly helpful to us as we get ready for the book launch, and if you pre-order a hardcover in the United States, it will even come to you signed. Pre-order your copy today at underrealm.net slash wander. That's underrealm.net slash wander. Next up, we've published a new episode of Quest every week this year on Patreon. That's a lot of book that you can read right now. Patreon is a voluntary support website where you can chip in a little bit of cash each month to help support this show and keep me writing. All my patrons get to read my new books as I write them, and there are tons of other cool benefits depending on your level of support. To read Quest right now, support me for a dollar a month, or more than a dollar a month, over at patreon.com slash Garrett B. Robinson. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Garrett B. Robinson. Okay, now it's time for today's episode. Today, you're getting Chapter 34 of Darkfire. When we left off, Lauren, Alburn, Zane, and Ennis had just escaped the Shade Stronghold on horseback, but without Jem and Jordell. Enjoy! Darkfire, Chapter 34 "'We will not have long,' cried Alburn, shouting over the thundering hooves. "'They will not let us escape so easily, and soon they will recover their steeds. Ride as hard as you can, and do not stop for anything.' They hardly needed his urging. The stronghold had already vanished in the rain behind them, but still Loren could feel its presence, like a great malevolent being with all its thought bent upon them. Mayup it was only her imagination, or mayup some dark magic of Triskin's, but either way she urged Midnight on to greater and greater speed. She caught a glimpse of Annis' face as they rode, wide-eyed and filled with fright, as Loren knew her own must be. Zane rode silently, his eyes filled with quiet intensity as he gripped the reins. He must be in great pain, she realized, for likely he was still weak from the Magestone sickness. Despite Lauren's sense of a watchful presence behind them, they saw no sign of pursuit. The road from the stronghold delved straight into a crevasse in the mountains, where a peak looked like it had been cloven in two by a giant's axe. The cleft made a passageway that had been flattened by craftsmen long ago, and it was wide enough for all of them to ride abreast with room on either side. The passageway ended after a time, and Lauren was surprised to see another gate looming ahead. But this one had long fallen into disrepair, and the shades had not yet occupied it. The stone bridge between the towers had fallen to rubble, and the towers themselves looked ready to collapse with a strong gust of wind. Not a soul observed them as they passed through, slowing to a brisk walk so the horses would not lose their footing upon the stones. "'I'm glad to see this place empty,' said Alburn. "'You knew it was here?' said Lauren. He tossed his head. "'It was here when last I came this way. I guessed that the shades had not yet taken it, for as you can see it is in far worse repair than the stronghold.' 
And what if you had been wrong, and we found soldiers waiting to stop us? said Annis angrily. Alburn shrugged. Then we would have devised another plan. It hardly seemed likely that we would get this far. Beyond the gate lay another narrow pass snaking through the mountains. They seemed to be heading gently downwards now, and Lauren thought this must be the descent out of the mountains that Alburn had spoken of. The horses stepped with more vigor, almost as if they could sense freedom ahead. But still Lauren felt darkness haunting their steps, and she could not shake the feeling. Then, as they crested a rise and prepared to climb down the other side, they heard a screeching on the air. Instinct made them duck, even as their horses reared beneath them. Harpies swept down out of the air to attack. "'Now we know they are minions of Triskin, or mayhap of his master,' cried Alburn. "'I thought our escape seemed too easy.' He had his bow in his hand and had stolen many arrows from within the stronghold. Shafts flew up to strike the creatures as they dove, and several fell before him. The rest swooped up and away, screaming at the party in fury. They dove again, and Lauren brought her own bow up to shoot them. But they dodged and wove in tight circles as they descended, and she could not find her mark. Only Alburn's arrows sped true. Beside her she saw a familiar glow. She glanced over and saw light blooming from Zane's eyes. His hand twisted into a claw as he whispered words in a strange tongue. He raised the hand skyward, his flames streaking for the harpies. It was a weak, sputtering fire, far more meager than she had seen from him before, but it curved in the air and struck one of the beasts, singeing its wings. Once more the harpies broke off their attack. Zane slumped forwards over his saddle, holding the horn tightly to keep himself from falling. With a nudge of her heels, Lauren brought Midnight alongside him and gripped his shoulder. "'Are you all right?' she said. "'I have not the strength,' he gasped. "'Not yet. I am sorry.' "'Do not blame yourself,' said Alburn. "'We are too exposed. Come, let us ride.' Their horses flew down the mountainside now, needing no urging from their riders as they caught the harpies' scent. The harpies swooped low, emboldened by the party's flight. But Alburn took them off the path and into the thin, scrubby trees to the right, where the harpies could no longer see them. "'This will not last,' said Alburn. "'But may have we can remain under cover until we think of a plan, or until those creatures give up.' "'They will not give up,' said Lauren. And if we wait too long, no doubt the shades will find us. What is your counsel, then? Ride back out into the open? said Alburn gruffly. Then he ducked his head. I'm sorry. I have no right to speak thus. Before Lauren could answer, braying erupted from the mountains all around. They wheeled their horses about, Alburn knocking an arrow quicker than blinking. Lauren's eyes went wide. From the crags all around them came satyrs, clutching weapons and vaulting down on their hairy hind legs. There were far more than they had seen before reaching the Shade stronghold, and the goat men's faces twisted in rage. More minions of the Shades, said Alburn. Ride on! They had no choice except to return to the open path, and their horses raced down it in panic. But the road twisted and turned, and the satyrs could leap straight over any rise the road had to avoid. They gained ground swiftly. The harpies drew ever closer, until Lauren could feel the wind of their wings. "'They will be on us in moments,' said Lauren. "'Alburn, we must find some hiding place.' His face was grim as he brought his horse to a halt, looking at her from across the road. "'There are none. No places where they will not find us.' Yet mayhap there is somewhere to make our stand. Lauren's throat went dry. She understood his words. A last stand, some place where they could fight until they were overwhelmed. It seemed a cruel way to die, here on the road so far from home. Would anyone find her bones, or would they be mere fodder for the satyrs? Alburn took them off the road again, to a small hollow that lay close by. The mountainside curved up and over it, forming a sort of cave that blocked the harpies. There were many boulders laid across the opening to offer cover from the satyr's arrows. Alburn led them in at a gallop, and when they came to a halt, they all dismounted. At once Alburn went to the mouth of the hollow, 
bow half-drawn in his hand. The satyrs pulled up short, out of bowshot, beating their spears against each other and bleeding. The harpies circled, screaming with their eyes fixed on the travelers. The hollow ended some ten paces in. There was no way out, except through their enemies. "'The satyrs will strike first, said Alburn. His voice was matter-of-fact, as though he were giving them directions to the nearest inn. "'Likely they are waiting for some champion to come forth and drive them onwards.' "'What do we do?' said Annis, gripping Lauren's arm. "'How do we escape?' Alburn turned to her and spoke flatly. "'We do not escape. We fight until we are killed. "'If you wish to die with a weapon in your hand, I shall give you one. "'If you wish to use it upon me before our enemy strikes, "'I will not blame you or stop you.' But Lauren ignored him and Annis both. She pulled her arm from the girl's clutching hand and went instead to Zane. The wizard leaned on a boulder near the entrance. His eyes were closed, and he drew deep, hasty breaths, as though he had just run a league without stopping. Zane, how deeply can we trust you? He opened his eyes to stare at her in confusion. With your lives, though I do not blame you for doubting me, yet I can be of little help now. You saw my flames upon the road. I could not defeat Jem with my magic, much less this army of evil beasts. If you had such power, would you use it to help us? Of course, I... Zane froze. His eyes found hers, and in his face she saw a curious light. But it dampened in an instant, and he turned away. Lauren went to Midnight's saddle, where she had thrown the bag Annis had brought during their escape. She withdrew her black cloak, and from its pocket she produced a brown cloth packet. Annis gasped. Lauren returned to Zane and held the packet out to him. "'Here is all the strength you need,' she said. "'Prove that your words are not an empty boast. Use your power to help us.' "'You are mad,' said Zane and Annis at the same time. They looked at each other for a moment, and then Zane went on. "'You saw what they did to me, when I used them and after. I would not wish that pain on my most hated enemy.' He is right, Lauren, said Alburn. This course seems unwise. I have seen Magestone sickness. It is not something I would witness again. Yet with the stone's power, you vanquished Vivian upon the dragon's tail, said Lauren. You were starved half to death, yet you defeated her. You staved off the Dorshan invasion of Wellmont. You sank their fleet upon the river west of the city. And I nearly killed all of you snapped Zane. Lauren, I tried to kill you. I wanted to, desperately. You do not know the whispers that Magestones plant in the mind. You cannot imagine how hard I had to struggle just to keep you all— Enough! roared Lauren. Zane fell silent and took a step back. You claim you were sorry for what you did. You say you wish to atone for your wrongs. Prove it! Prove it now, or we all die here. You say the Maidstones whisper to you, and that it is a struggle to resist them. Then struggle, and win. Was it torturous to suffer the Maidstone sickness? Then suffer that torture again. Do it to save us, and to save our friends, and prove you are worthy of the trust that Jordel placed in you. Zane stared at the ground, and did not answer her at first. Outside the hollow, the satyrs brayed louder. Alburn had not fired at them yet, and they were growing bolder. Zane looked over his shoulder, out into the open air where the beasts waited. Then, in one sudden motion, he snatched the brown cloth packet from her hand and ripped it open. With thin and wasted fingers, he plucked one of the mage stones from the packet and shoved it between his lips. His teeth crunched down, and he swallowed. Zane bent his head his shoulders shuddering. Though he was the same height as always, Lauren would have sworn that she felt him grow somehow. As she watched in fascination, the skin of his hands and hollow cheeks filled out, and where his hair had been patchy and thin before, 
It grew thick and lustrous, glinting in the gray sunlight that filtered down through the clouds. From behind his closed eyelids, Loren saw white light spill forth, like fire hidden behind a doorframe. Slowly, the white light turned black. He opened his eyes, and they were bottomless pools of ebony, looking at her without emotion. Lauren had to restrain herself from stepping back. Zane? she said tentatively. I am here, he said. I am myself. He turned on his heel, so suddenly that Lauren jumped. He strode out between the boulders and into the open air. Alburn reached to grab the wizard's arm, but Lauren stopped him. The satyrs had edged slowly forwards. When they saw Zane emerge, they fell back, bleeding. But when they realized he was alone and unarmed, they cried out in rage and swept forwards to attack. Zane called out a word and swept his arm in a wide arc. A wall of fire erupted from the ground, casting earth high into the air with a tumultuous explosion. The fire swept forth, and though the satyrs turned to flee, they could not run fast enough. The flames covered and consumed them, and they fell wailing to the ground, their bodies burning away. The harpies, seeing the satyr's fate, wheeled in the air to flee. But Zane put forth his power, and a gale of wind swept down from the sky. The rain clouds above turned into a storm, black and terrible, and lightning crashed from on high. It struck with terrible fury, turning great circles of earth into molten rock. The bolts struck the harpies down, and in moments the skies were clear. Zane's magic subsided, and all was silent. Lauren stood beside Alburn, both of them frozen in awe. Annis hid behind them, clutching Lauren's sleeve, as if for protection. As if I could save her from Zane, if he chose to harm us. Zane turned back, and the black glow faded from his eyes. His expression was grim, but curling the corner of his mouth was the same smirk he had worn the day Lauren first met him. She swallowed hard, hoping she had not made a terrible mistake. He tossed his head. Come, fetch the horses. We ride for the fort. This has been a production of Legacy Books, written and narrated by Garrett Robinson. The music in this podcast was created by Will Musser. Check out his incredible work at willmusser.com. That's W-I-L-L-M-U-S-S-E-R dot com. Today's letter is L. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.